And the first speaker for this afternoon is uh, uh, Emilio Trevisani. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank the organizer for this uh, beautiful meeting and uh, for the opportunity to uh, give this talk. So it's going to be a talk shared with uh, Laura. Uh, and uh, at the topic is uh, celestial amplitudes or celestial CFT. And uh, the topic is, um, it's fairly recent, but uh, it, it's very interesting because it's really rich. It brings together a lot of concepts and ideas from different uh, parts of physics. And um, so just to give you an idea of how these uh, uh, two lectures are going to go. So th this uh, lecture that I'm going to give is mainly uh, related to this part. Uh, uh, I mean, these are just three of many subjects that one could draw as connections that are brought together uh, for these uh, celestial amplitudes. But I'm going to focus mostly on this connection between amplitudes and CFTs. And Laura uh, uh, will uh, explain some connections uh, with asymptotic symmetries. And so this uh, will uh, enrich in the story. And um, so um, the plan of the talk uh, is going to be, I, I hope, uh, simple and understandable. Uh, I'm starting with some motivations, and uh, then I'll explain something very basic, just uh, soft theorems. So these are really standard, uh, uh, standard concept in quantum field theories. Uh, like uh, they come from the 60s by works of Weinberg, so it's really very basic stuff. And uh, then I'll introduce uh, uh, celestial amplitudes, and I'll explain what the role in life. Uh, and uh, I mean, there are actually many things that one can say. I'll, I'll mostly focus on what is uh, uh, the how you can interpret the soft theorems in in terms of this celestial amplitude story. So this is uh, uh, hopefully uh, what I, I'm gonna be able to explain. Um, so um, let me give you a basic idea of what is a celestial amplitude. Before starting a motivation, I, I want to give you at least a, a, a vague idea of what I'm gonna sell you. So uh, what is this, uh, well, celestial amplitude or celestial CFT? So sometimes you see it written just CCFT. Uh, it's the idea that, uh, let's say that if you start by some amplitude, let me be very schematic, like this. In some quantum field theory in, uh, in the dimension, you have uh, Lorentz symmetry in, uh, in the dimensions. And uh, so we, we are just considering flat space uh, quantum field theory, so something very simple. And uh, so the idea is that uh, we want to map this to an object that looks like a, a correlation function. So it, it would be something like that. And, uh, and how you, you can interpret this, why this can be possible, or it's almost actually trivial that this should actually happen. It's because, uh, um, well, you see, Lorentz in the dimension, it's isomorphic to SOD minus 1, comma 1. And this is also the conformal group in D minus 2 dimensions. So this is what we uh, want to use. So this is the, the main uh, idea. So that Lorentz in the dimension and the conformal uh, in D minus two are basically the same thing. And so you expect that there should be some kind of uh, rewriting of this object in terms of something that looks like uh, a correlation function. So that's uh, uh, the, the main idea. And uh, with this in mind, I, I can uh, give you some motivation for this. Uh, I'll, I'll be uh, brief since, uh, uh, I mean, I hope that the talk will be the motivation, so uh, at the end of the talk, hopefully you will be convinced that uh, there is something. Um, 
But uh, let me give you some more, let's say, far-fetched goal just to, to keep in mind. So one of the things that uh, one can try to do with this uh, story in principle is uh, to consider quantum gravity in asymptotically flat space. So, well. And um, so why this uh, could be something that one can study in this framework? Well, uh, there are two things that can give you that at least are in that direction. The, the first thing is that we are talking about scattering amplitudes. So that's a, a natural object to consider in quantum gravity. The other thing is that uh, this is some sort of holographic principle. And so we expect some kind of holographic principle to hold in general. And this is uh, the usual argument of the entropy, entropy of a black hole that scale like the area. And so you, you imagine that independently of the, the space-time asymptotic, you should have some sort of uh, uh, holographic principle. Isn't the holographic principle like the naive, uh, well, maybe not naive at all, but the general idea of holographic principle goes to one dimension less rather than Indeed, two? I agree, yeah. So this is indeed some sort of holography that is a bit, uh, if you want, less expected. <laughs> but, uh, but in terms of this, uh, uh, this map, uh, it's also very natural to imagine that uh, you have uh, some uh, uh, co-dimension two uh, theory. So you, I don't know. This is, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's some sort of far-fetched goal, but at least it's going in some direction that is kind of good. So uh, another uh, maybe easier goal is uh, is to understand better, uh, let's say, as matrix theory. So we, we had these uh, very nice uh, lectures um, about uh, as matrix bootstrap. And so we saw that uh, indeed there are some uh, axioms for as matrices. And one can lift uh, these axioms and actually get a lot of uh, understanding of the space of allowed as matrices. And so, um, I mean, there are two things that one can do in this direction uh, with a map of this kind. One thing maybe is a bit hard, and it's the fact that, uh, so if we have a way to actually encode uh, an S matrix as a, something like a CFT correlator, in principle, CFT, uh, uh, I mean, CFTs are actually really, really, well under control when, when they are nice CFTs. So, uh, and there, there are some very strong axioms that uh, actually one can use and understand uh, very well the, the space of the theories. And so uh, one can, if one is really able to reformulate in terms of some nice CFT, one can use that and actually understand even just the axioms of, uh, of the S matrix. Of course, this is a bit, uh, I mean, I'm a bit cheating at this point because what we are gonna find is something that is uh, not uh, so easy as a CFT. So we will not actually know the axioms of this CFT. So, but in principle, we can imagine that in, in some future, we will, we will understand the CFT well and then reconstruct the S matrix. So uh, that's a possibility. And then another thing is that uh, um, with this uh, different representation that I didn't say, but it's actually just a, a very basic change of basis. So I can even write uh, this spoiler. So th it will be just a melding transform. So something very basic on the momenta of the particle. So it's really, really simple. And so it's just a different basis, and maybe in this basis uh, uh, it will be clear that, there, that if there are some new axioms, so let's say that, uh, yeah, in general, let's say, I would say understanding axioms, either the usual one or new ones. 
And, uh, and the, the last point uh, that I want to make is that uh, as if it was maybe clear in, the, uh, in this uh, asymmetric bootstrap talks, but uh, mm, so asymmetric theory is actually quite hard when you deal with uh, four-dimensional gaplets theories. So in that case, uh, so uh, let me just write uh, gapless uh, QFT4. So that's, that's a very hard uh, uh, thing to study because there are log divergences and in principle this matrix is not uh, very well defined. And so we may want to understand, let's say, these uh, IR properties of the quantum field theory or this matrix and understand uh, yeah, log divergences. And another thing that is related to that uh, is soft theorems. They're all of soft theorems. So uh, you see, these are goals. This is probably the hardest one. This is a middle one. This is probably what we can actually tackle uh, like more easily. So um, questions on the motivation? Yeah. Uh, one question. When you s write this arrow with the Madeline, is it obvious that you relate something in d dimension to something in d minus two? Well, uh, yeah, maybe let me just go at some point. Uh, uh, at this point, yeah. I will actually uh, just explain. Uh, just something else. Uh, very when you say that, uh, yeah, like there are this problem with the S matrix of gapless theories, do we. Like through this mapping, do this problem have some avatar in the celestial CFT? Like, do we an, is there some feature of the celestial CFT? Yeah. So uh, indeed, I I think that uh, w what I'm gonna try to tell you is that uh, yeah, soft theorems, for example, that are related are basically very much related to also these log divergences. So these are properties due to soft particles. I see. And uh, and the properties of soft particles, I think it will be probably clear at the end of the talk that uh, are very nicely captured uh, by this um, simple map. Okay. Okay. So. Oops. Ah, um, there are more questions. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> Can you say something about uh, unitarity, how unitarity is mapped in the CFT? Yeah, so in principle, one could also study unitarity. And uh, I mean, there are a lot of things uh, uh, that one can, uh, can, I mean, one can take some axiom of the, uh, of the amplitude and map it uh, uh, in principle to the CFT and, uh, and see what, what it yeah. means for the CFT. So, but many things are not done yet, so these, uh, these questions are still uh, open. But do people have any idea of uh, what would correspond in a CFT case? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, the, in practice I would say no, there are some maybe discussions, okay. but uh, not, uh, not in detail. No, there's no, no clean idea, let's say. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so then if the motivation is fine, I'll go to soft theorems and uh, hopefully this will be something very simple. So soft theorems indeed appear when uh, there are some particles that are massless and uh, and so soft, uh, it actually means that uh, you are bringing the momenta uh, of that particle to zero. Or better, uh, if you want to write uh, the, let's write the momenta of one massless particle, we want to write it uh, in terms of some frequencies like that, where this Q is uh, squares to zero, and, uh, and the limit uh, for 
for um, the, the soft uh, limit would be for this frequency going to zero. So th this is what uh, we want to study. And uh, so the amplitude that we want to consider is something generic like that. And then we want to take one particle, let's say this one, to be uh, indeed uh, this massless particle. So with uh, momentum omega q. And we want to study, so these are some other momenta, p1, pn. And we want to... Yeah, it's just uh, a way to to send this to zero, <laughs> let's say. We want to study this limit for omega going to zero. It's just a parameterization. It's, it's like the energy of, of the particle. Um, okay, so uh, we want to study this in the limit of omega going to zero. And, uh, and so this will be written as uh, something that is in practice the same amplitude, but without this uh, extra leg. And here there will be some uh, term that in principle you can, uh, there are some known functions of the momenta. So let's say I, I write them with some labels. Okay, these are not so conventional, but uh, hopefully it, it's, it's gonna be clear. So these labels here are powers, uh, uh, powers of omega. So this will scale like one over omega. This is uh, omega to the zero, etc. So this is what uh, I mean by this S. And, um, and so this is in general the, what you expect by this uh, soft photon, so, sorry, soft theorems. And let me just be quite... Could, could you remind us why it's linearly divergent, the first term? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm going to explain this. So the, so the idea is that... Uh, so I, I wanted to explain you why there are some uh, terms... Uh, I mean, why you would expect anything of this sort uh, from... Uh, from from that limit. So the, the idea is that uh, in practice, this kind of expansion can arise only when you attach uh, this soft particle to some of the external legs. And so this is uh, actually quite easy to see because external legs are on shell. And so what you see is that uh, once you attach the soft uh, particle to the external leg, here you get uh, a propagator. Let's consider, for example, that the, the easiest one would be a, a scalar propagator. And the propagator would be, let's say, if this is some pi, and this is your omega q, you would have some pi plus omega q squared, and maybe there's some mass. But the pi is, uh, is on shell, and so pi squared actually cancel the mass. And so this sort of, uh, uh, this propagator will actually give you some, okay, pi squared plus m squared, that is just zero, and then you have some q squared that is zero, and so you are left with this uh, like two q dot pi. And so you see that uh, you have a divergence that uh, is uh, one over omega. And this is really very generic, uh, but, uh, and, and you see that the computation is, is incredibly simple. It's super clean. You can do some example and you'll see that, I mean, this is in practice the, the whole explanation that, uh, of, the, of these theorems. And you'll see that uh, if you do oh, it, for sorry. example. Uh, I, I mean, why it, it needs to be attached to an external leg? 
Yeah, because if you attach it to anything that is uh, not on shell, then it's not true anymore that uh, this is zero. So, uh, sorry, maybe I'm missing. So, so for example, so imagine I, that I, I agree that if it is attached on an external leg, then the behavior is one over omega. Yeah. Now, is the statement that the behavior is always one over omega, or that is only in this case? Because no, uh, the 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 statement will be that uh, the leading divergence is, uh, is actually one over omega, okay. always, and. Uh, and uh, the computation that gives you the one over omega, the only way to get the one over omega is to attach it to a, an external leg. Okay. And if you, for example, if you imagine this coming from, I don't know, some loop inside uh, uh, your amplitude, this will be in a, some loop integral, but that's not on shell, and so you, you, will, not dis you, you okay. will not have this uh, uh, property. And so you will not just get uh, that term, and so mm -hmm. you, you don't get the divergence. So this is the worst case in a sense, and it is yeah, linear that, divergence. Yes, okay. that's uh, indeed. And so everything else will not give you the divergence. Indeed, this is a perturbative argument. Everything here is perturbative, but uh, there's a, a good uh, thing about that is that uh, I mean, I, I wanted to <laughs> go a bit on and tell you before uh, yeah, a couple of things, but I can just uh, tell you right now that even if it's perturbative, it's true uh, at uh, typically all loops. Let's say that the leading one, it's actually three, three level exact. So you compute it at three level, you see this is a three level computation, you do it once, and since you know that if you attach it to any loop, it doesn't change, because they, they are not gonna give you any uh, divergence, you know that the, the result uh, uh, at all loops is gonna be that. Of course, you, you don't know if there are non-perturbative corrections, uh, that's, uh, that's another story. No, no, I mean, loop don't, don't enter there. So this is no, it still uh, still doesn't. It, you see, it's it's really uh, you can put any loops there. You see, it's so it doesn't doesn't change this behavior. So th this is uh, indeed. I I wanted to write maybe some example so that uh, it's uh, is cleaner the yeah and there's a question wow <laughs> <laughs> thank you now, uh, can you persuade me that uh, if for example does work right if uh, q enters immediately in a loop uh, it does not contribute because, I mean, in my understanding, uh, you will integrate over the loop momenta, right? Yeah. So for, for sure there is a, at least a, a momenta in which the loop disappears, essentially, the L equals zero, right? Because you're integrating over all possible loops. I mean, over all possible momenta. And so naively I would say that uh, you should expect uh, such a divergence also if uh, that, uh, that guy enters in a loop immediately. Well, I don't know. If you want, I, I can I can spell it out. I I think it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. Okay, maybe I need to do it. Uh, yeah, okay. I think if you do it carefully, you'll see that it doesn't actually give you any pull. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. I just find it strange. No, but thanks for for the question. Is there any way to derive this result without you know? doing these things with the diagrams? Yeah, uh, indeed. I don't know of any way to derive it that is not just diagrammatic. Yeah, something. Well, okay. I mean, I guess 
So perhaps you, you, you can summarize the comments for people at home that uh, don't, don't, cannot hear those comments. Well, the, no, it's all right. it's just, yeah. yeah, the comment was that maybe there, in, in Weinberg's paper there was uh, some, uh, some argument that was non-perturbative, but I think that, uh, I, I don't know. Okay. As, as far as I understand, it looks like, uh, at least there are some assumptions that look like uh, they are taking something from perturbation theory. So but maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. So I, 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 I would suggest you have anything to... I, I would suggest that this could become well, a point for I, discussion I, for yeah, the I'll go second on. part, yeah, uh, for the later part of the talk. But. Yeah, let me go on. Uh, so the... So what, what I wanted to write now are some uh, examples for that. Uh, so, in particular, uh, I'll start by, uh, well, let me consider the case of photons. So, this would be the soft photon theorem. You can do, or you can compute this S minus 1, and uh, it will be 1 over omega, and uh, there's some, uh, okay, some charge. Of because, yeah, here maybe I can also add that this particle uh, can have uh, some, uh, uh, could be like uh, a photon, and so you, you want to actually contract it with some polarization vector, epsilon, and, uh, and this particle may be charged, so you can uh, put some charge Q1, uh, and, uh, and once you do that, you'll see that this, uh, this factor S minus 1, in this case, will take this uh, very simple form. And it's, well, of this form, let's say. If you want here, you would have some signs to say if the particle is in or out. This is plus or minus 1 for in, out. And, um, and okay, so this is the old formula. I mean, this is quite, uh, quite remarkable, no? You, you have this, you, you just send the omega to zero, and you get this S minus one that is just what I wrote, times this thing. So, uh, it's it's a very simple formula, and um, and okay, this is uh, three level exact. And um, yeah, and it's fine. So so then you can do something similar for gravitons. So. Actually, I don't know if it will fit, but uh, S minus 1 actually takes almost the same form. But since you have two polarization vectors for the gravitons, you need to contract both of them. By the way, maybe I can also explain why you have this numerator. It's, it's uh, in practice, the only thing that you can have. <laughs> you see, when, when you're here, you want, to, you want to see what's in the numerator, so it will come from the vertex. But you have to contract one epsilon, and epsilon cannot be contracted with Q, and it will be then contracted with this uh, PI. So in the end, this is the only thing that you can get. Uh, and here it's something similar, but this will gonna be uh, is gonna be squared, and uh, and so this is the, the kind of uh, uh, the kind of uh, leading uh, soft uh, graviton theorem. And you can also, and this is also three level exact. And you can also do, um, to, you can also go subleading, and here you'll get some formula of this 
form. Well, I, I'm, yeah, there's in principle also this uh, eta also there. Yeah, kappa, uh, I'm, I, you, can, you can see it, uh, it's like when you expand the, the kappa will be like this object in front of the definition of your gravity. So I, I think you should try to write a little bit larger perhaps. Ah, it's okay, a bit, uh, thanks. Okay, so yeah, here I'll try. So this is gonna be something like pj dot epsilon divided by pj dot q. And here you have epsilon and there is some operator that now I've defined and uh, so this J is just, uh, they, they, they are just rotation. So they are just PJ, uh, let's say this is mu in nu, and you have uh, mu and D PJ nu, and you anti symmetrize. So it's usual rotations. So this is an operator if you want that acts on the amplitude. So you have to imagine that that is acting on the amplitude. And, uh, but still, it's, uh, it's a formula that uh, is just well defined. To be uh, exact, here there's, uh, uh, there are one loop. It's a, it's a one loop uh, exact, let's say. So you, you have to compute also one loop corrections and, uh, and after that is exact. So these are, uh, well, the the soft theorems I, I care about. And, uh, and I wanted to uh, point out one thing that, uh, so they are, yeah, and also here, if you want, there's still this eta. Please. So you say this thing is one loop exact, but where do the one loop corrections enter in that formula? Yeah, so you see, this is subleading. So oh, in that sense, one loop. In that sense. Not, not that the formula itself is, is not correct. And no, no. Okay. The, no, no, there, there, there are corrections to this formula. But uh, you see, the, the argument that I gave before, uh, saying that, uh, I mean, if you start from, uh, if, you, if you send this, uh, 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 this soft particle out from some loop, internal lag, let's say, uh, that's, not contr that's not giving a pole. But uh, this is not giving a pole either. <laughs> and so yeah, you have a one loop uh, correction. And, um, but the point is that it's still exact. And I, I think it's quite striking even at this point uh, that you have formula that uh, are like three level exact, one loop exact. I mean, this kind of thing are a bit uh, too magical to be true. Like, uh, how can that be correct in a, in a generic theory? So notice that this is also very universal. Uh, I didn't say it, but if you change the, the matter content, I mean, yeah, I, I, I was saying this may be a scalar, but this also may be another kind of particle, could be uh, anything. And so this is, uh, uh, it's really strong, uh, theorem, these are really strong theorem, and it looks like there, there should be some sort right. of uh, deeper interpretation. Didn't your argument uh, assume that the solid lines had masses? At least the way no, that you no, presented uh, it here. No, they, they can be also massless. Okay, but the way that you presented it here, you had this argument that, well, if it's on shell, the mass cancels and so on. No, but uh, yeah, still, uh, still the, the story would okay. work. Yeah, actually, at some point, will this become theory dependent? Like if you go sub subleading, will yeah, it be it, theory dependent? That, that's a uh, that's great uh, question. Indeed, if you go subleading, there, there are some uh, terms that are non-universal. In principle, there are some terms that are still universal, but plus corrections that are theory dependent. Mm -hmm. So that, that's true. And in general, I would say that if you go <laughs> let's say, uh, at some order, generic uh, S 
k, you, and these are not so well studied, and maybe you have results at tree level, but uh, let's say the, the full story is much more complicated. There is a paper by Ashoke that does this, right? Yeah, there, there, are, this. there are, there are story, yeah, indeed. Th there's that paper, but there are also other papers uh, around. <laughs> and, um, okay, but my, my point here is to say that these are like a really strong and powerful uh, uh, formula, and it's weird that they exist, and it would be nice to have some, let's say, symmetry interpretation. Because you, you see, when you have something so strong, you imagine that there's some symmetry reasoning that tells you that uh, actually that must be the formula. And, uh, and for these, uh, as, uh, I think it's good to, yeah, I'm really slow, so what, what's, <laughs> okay, that's very nice. <laughs> uh, Okay, so <laughs> what I'm going to introduce now uh, is uh, celestial amplitudes. Well, let's call it CCFT. Uh, so as I said, uh, the main idea is, is the fact that uh, this group can be interpreted as uh, either the Lorentz group or the conformal group. And um, so let me just uh, consider, this is just for simplicity, a massless case. A massless amplitude. And um, so again, all uh, the momenta are gonna be labeled by this omega i, qi. Th this can be generalized. Uh, if you want, I can talk about it, but uh, let, let me keep it simple. So you have some in and out state, something like that, and, and you write this as very generically in this way. So the, the definition of uh, a celestial amplitude um, it's just uh, it, it's just taking some Mellin transforms of the omegas. So let me write the definition. So for each particle, each ex external particle, I'm gonna take an integral in the omega i with weight uh, uh, that is this delta i. And so this is, well, let me write it this way. So this is going to be the definition. So this definition has uh, three properties that I want to spell out. So the, the first one is that yeah, I don't know if it's gonna be readable, okay. It's, uh, okay, it's Lorentz invariant for this Q, this, as a function of QI, it's, uh, it's Lorentz invariant, of course. A second property is that uh, it's defined in the space where all the QI is squared to zero. And the third property, is easy to check is that if you rescale all momenta, or well, all the QI by some lambda, we can do this exercise here. It's it's quite easy. You you rescale this QI by lambda. Well, this is probably not going to be readable. So um, you rescale this QI by lambda. You can undo this by rescaling omega i by omega i over lambda, so this is the same, but you see that here, this, okay, this is invariant, and this will just give rise to a, a lambda to the minus delta, okay? And so the result of this will be just a product from one to n of lambda i to the minus delta i times the same thing 
without uh, this parameter lambda i that are like generic parameters. Okay, so I imagine that some of you in the audience <laughs> know what is uh, a function with this property. It's I don't know, for people that do conformal field theory, it's quite, uh, yeah, it's a quite well-known function. Is uh, It would be a correlation function in embedding space. So uh, maybe it's, uh, it's good to review quickly what, what is that for people that are not familiar. There's a question. Sure. Uh, will you say something? about convergence of this Smelling transform? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great, uh, it's a really a great question. So indeed, uh, uh, the way I'm presenting it, it looks like uh, it's an innocuous uh, uh, kind of transform. Of course, uh, it's actually quite of a deep thing that we are doing. So you see, the amplitude typically, it's, it's also, for, for a given theory, it's defined typically with some cutoff. So, so this, it's an integral over all energies. So you, you first need a theory that is UV complete to do this. And also you have to hope that uh, this integral is actually convergent. Yeah, th there are some, uh, uh, some uh, well, at least ideas for which UV complete theories will have some soft behavior in the UV. And uh, for, for this, let's say, omega that is large, uh, there will be some dumping, and so the integral is actually probably gonna be convergent. However, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, at this point, we are assuming it. We are s assuming that this integral is fine, and that we know that uh, amplitude is for some UV complete theory. Okay. So, um, unless everybody's familiar with, uh, uh, with this uh, embedding space, I was planning to give a very short introduction about that. I suspect that a short introduction is appropriate, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So, the, this embedding space is, uh, is a trick, just that is used in, in CFT let's say in CFT in generic dimension is just a trick that is indeed is using this same idea that uh, the SOD minus one comma one is both the conformal group and uh, the Lorentz group. So it's the same idea, but it's kind of in reverse, if you want. Uh, wh what do I mean? I mean that uh, you have a CFT in the dimension and typically, well, let, let me actually call it in D minus two to keep uh, to be, keep it similar uh, to our discussion. So here, typically, you have insertions that x m, where this m goes from one to d minus two. So this is a point in r d minus two. So these are your insertions. But the idea is that a conformal group uh, it's, is actually a complicated group that doesn't act linearly. And so you have like this special conformal transformation that are tough to deal with. And so what do you do? You actually uplift this to a, a bigger space that is uh, two-dimensional higher, that is indeed uh, Rd minus one comma one. And, uh, but since you are in a bigger space, uh, you, you, you reduce it by one dimension, asking that you are on this uh, null cone, defined by this. And, uh, and l let me start by giving you a picture of this uh, procedure. So you have uh, some uh, Q0 direction, and you want to write some cone like this. So this is the cone Q squared equal to zero. But still, uh, and so at each point, well, each line passing through the origin will be uh, describing a point in uh, one less dimension. That is the point of the physical space of your CFT. And you can also pay, pick one, project, one, uh, one section of this, and this will actually may give you really back your initial space. So the typical way to go back is to take this uh, Poincaré 
transaction, which is defined by is q0 plus qd minus 1 equal to 1, which can be parameterized indeed by point x. So you then write So this is the, the way you go back. And uh, pictorially, this would be like taking a section that would look like this. Well, it's not uh, a very nice drawing, but it, hopefully it's understandable. And so each point here will be some x in the initial space. But why you do all this machinery is just because on this space, all uh, the conformal group really acts just like rotations. And so it's very, very simple. And, uh, and so this is really used a lot in, in CFTs. For example, you can fix correlation function. The, 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 the conformal symmetry will be much more manifest. And so, for example, for operator with spin, it will be much easier to write the conformal invariant correlation, correlation function, or let's say tensor structures. And uh, there, there's an extra thing that I didn't tell you that uh, there's a way to uplift uh, operators that live here to operator that live on the f this full space. And, uh, and the way to do it is to require that uh, they have this scaling. So if, let's say that this, if this is a primary with dimension delta, it will rescale like this. And so you see that uh, you can now recognize the, the properties that I wrote above. So what, what we have above, it's uh, something that is Lorentz invariant. It's defined on this null cone where this is true. And all, all these points rescale like operators defined in embedding space. So in practice, what we have there can be understood as um, so this is, is just, uh, well, this uh, A tilde of QI can be understood of some correlation function. In embedding space. And of course, when you want in embedding space, you can always project to, the, to your physical space. And so then write it in terms of x, and uh, everything will be uh, written in as a physical space correlation function. So hopefully this was uh, clear. So, um, uh, Emilio, I uh, have a question. Yeah, please, hey, go ahead. Uh, so, hey, uh, so this delta that you wrote down, is sure. it arbitrary? Does yeah. it follow from the theory you have? That, that's another great question. So that's, uh, that's another point. That, uh, so in principle, in a CFT, the, the, well, we, we know very well that delta is the spectrum of your operator. So it's like something that is fixed and, uh, and is actually very, yeah, I mean, it's very, very rigid. Well, here it looks like these are just parameters that I pick. And, and indeed, it's, it's kind of a tricky business, this one. So in, in principle, uh, you would want to find what is the spectrum of these uh, theories. The first uh, approximation would be to consider this uh, uh, delta i to be on the principal series. But uh, this is what has been done a lot uh, since, um, well, on the principal series, at least you have uh, uh, some orthogonality uh, properties. And so uh, you can use that, um, for example, it, it's very good when you want to Mellin transform back if these uh, delta i's are on the principal series. But uh, in general, let's say that, uh, I would say that it's still an open problem to understand uh, what is the actual physical spectrum of, uh, uh, of these celestial CFTs. So uh, maybe another some other questions. So uh, one uh, uh, from me is uh, the fact that you have this scaling is one of the things that you expect from a CFT correlator, but it's not the only one, right? So 
you would you would want other properties, for instance, things that happens when you take the points close by and stuff like that. Indeed. Uh, so so you would you would want also some OP, for example, something like that. Indeed. If I have time in the end, I can uh, I can comment on that. But uh, l yeah, let me say it in in one uh, sentence. So the the idea would be that uh, when you take uh, the collinear limit of um, so what is the collinear limit is just. Uh, when in this amplitude you you take this momenta, let's say p1 and p2 to, to be parallel, let's say parallel, this uh, this limit would be mapped uh, as a to, to an OPE limit in uh, in this uh, celestial picture. So two things: one about these dimensions. Uh, I mean, I guess the choice you can choose uh, is related to the strip of analyticity of your Mellin transform and to convergence. Right? Yeah, and that's also true. Yeah. So it's not clear in principle which uh, dimensions would make sense. Yes. So, for example, uh, the principal series is, uh, is a good starting point. The thing of the principal series, as we saw in the, in the talk uh, by Michelangelo, so you have that a lot also in usual CFTs. You can I mean, formally, you can even write uh, w what he wrote exactly. It was like you have uh, some four-point function, u and v, and he wrote it as some integral in uh, some something like that. And, and, and let's say that you have some OPE coefficient that you could write like this with uh, some conformal block that depends on this uh, new. Well, there was some spin also, if you want, something like that. He could have said, well, the spectrum of my theory is the principal series. He didn't say that. Why he didn't say that? Because you, you well know that what you have when you have the spectrum, when, when you have this integral, is that on, on this principal series, so which would be d over 2 plus i alpha, yeah, al i nu, sorry. I, maybe it's better to say it for people that uh, are not so expert. So when one say principal series, it means that the dimension is this one. So it's complex, and it's d over 2 plus some imaginary uh, value. And so this integral would be an integral over this, but what you typically do is then to deform the contour and pick some poles that are typically on the real line, and then you define that to be the spectrum. But you see that in principle, one could have thought uh, from this formula that the uh, the spectrum was complex. So, mm, so yeah, uh, one has to be a bit careful. So I think that what we have in Celestial CFT is something that looks more like this, and we still don't know how to pick the poles. Uh, another uh, maybe naive question. I mean, you re reviewed this picture of the ambient space, and you said, I mean, uh, how to interpret this celestial sphere, I mean, this uh, space of cues. But usually, if I think of ADS-CFT, in, within this ambient space, I can also think of anti sitter. So in this ambient space, where would I think, how can I think of the original Minkowski? Well, uh, because I this mean, is momentum space. The, so it's the thing is that uh, the, the ambient space is Minkowski. Is that the, the cool thing? <laughs> so is the, is the actual Minkowski yeah, space I uh, is in coordinates not, or in momentum? Ah, you mean uh, in, uh, well, it's momentum space, but uh, they are, well, they are related in some sense. Uh, yeah, it would be at infinity, if you want, they, they would be related at, uh, uh, well, on, on the boundary, I would say. Because uh, in, in, when I have the picture of antidesitter, uh, antidesitter is uh, coordinates, not, uh, I mean, I have x uh, yeah, of okay. and on, at the boundary I have the position of the... Yeah. The boundary. Okay. If the boundary is momentum, and uh, it's it's very naive. But still, uh, I mean, it's it's almost the the, the same. Yeah. Okay, but uh, I'm I'm being very very slow because I mean at this point I would say that uh, yeah it, it, you can be very picky with this definition. Indeed, uh, it's it's full of things that are not under control. But I think that what I should tell you is what. Uh, it gives you, because it gives you something that is really non-trivial. And so let me just try to sell you this, uh, this point, that maybe it will be understandable. Indeed, it will be this one. The fact that, uh, 
soft theorems have a, a very nice interpretation in this basis. So for now, we assume that uh, everything is fine with this uh, uh, definition, and we, we, get, uh, w we try to see what uh, we can say about soft theorems. Well, uh, OK. Now, we also uh, work in d equal to 4. And, uh, and so we want to study soft theorems and, and see how they actually give rise to something, uh, some word identities for this uh, celestial CFT. So the, the first thing that I, I want to say is that, uh, OK, in 4D, uh, it's, OK, the ambient space is nice in generic dimension, but once the ambient space is in four dimensions, the, the lower space is two-dimensional, and, and we really know that in two dimensions you have just complex coordinates, which are just much better. So nobody actually cares about uh, this uh, embedding space formalism in four dimensions, because uh, uh, yeah, uh, you, you can just write everything in, in, uh, in, in complex variables. So let me do that. So this, uh, we want to write this map, but these are just uh, x1 and x2, and so I just can write z equal to. I, I write everything in terms of, of z and z bar. So the the picture of this uh, Poincaré project, projection is uh, like like that. That if you, I, I didn't tell you how it works with spin, but uh, trust me, <laughs> this is standard technology. So for spin, uh, in this case, it will give you. Uh, well, something like this. So you have some polarization vector and you want to project that also. And there are, um, there are actually two polarization vector that you can also take in the direction one plus I2 and one minus I2. And uh, so this would be one of them. And I write the second one with the bar and it's the, the complex conjugate. And uh, this is just zij. So this zij means z1 minus, sorry, zi minus zj. And, uh, and for the qi dot qj, this is, uh, uh, well, this is just the distance. And, uh, and uh, well, it would be something like zij times zij bar. So this is the prescription. Now, you pick this, this is, okay, this is step one. Step one is how to define the Poincaré uh, projection in 4D. The second point uh, is, is that we want to consider this uh, expansion uh, in, in powers of omega. And so I, I want to tell you how to take, uh, how to reconstruct uh, uh, the expansion of powers of omega from this uh, uh, amplitude that is written in uh, in this after this Mellin transform. So this is actually very easy. Well, actually, I can do it here. Let me. So the second step is uh, it's just noticing that powers of omega after a Mellin transform are mapped to poles. This is a very well known fact for people that work in in Mellin space. Uh, y y you get uh, that for uh, the, a power omega to the n, when you Mellin transform it, it gives you a pole like delta plus n. And so in practice, there's a, a way to reconstruct a power series of, uh, so let's, let's take a function just of one variable omega, and let's write it as uh, a power series like this. How, and, and let's imagine that uh, I can map it to uh, this Mellin space, and I get uh, this function a tilde of delta. So how do I reconstruct this term cn from this, this thing? It's just by taking residues. So the cn is actually equal 
just to the residue at delta equal to minus n of a tilde of delta. And so this is, uh, well, uh, quite trivial. One can do the, the integral, and it's, it's easy to, to see. So now we take point one and point two, so there, and we apply it to those uh, formula. The soft, for example, let's start by the soft photon. So, um, so we want to write it in Mellin, uh, uh, sorry, with this uh, Mellin uh, transform. And so uh, we want to reconstruct the term of one over omega. So what we get is that uh, we need to take a residue uh, at uh, delta equal to one, because it was uh, one over omega. So the pole is, uh, at, yeah, it's clear. Uh, for some operator O delta that we, we projected, and so it will depend on some Z and Z bar, let's say. And, uh, and then we have some other operators that we all project, uh, let's call it O1, ON. And then we just uh, uh, want to rewrite that term. So that term, you see, I just want to replace this pi dot epsilon and pi dot q. OK, but I have this prescription, so I just use this. There's, it's just plug it there. And you, you see that the, the result will be the following, minus 1 over square root of 2. And you have a sum with some charges qk and some z k minus z, and the same thing, O1, O n. OK, so let me uh, say one thing. So this object is actually a spin 1, because it came from, uh, um, from an object with spin. And so when, once you project it, it has also spin 1, j equal to 1. Well, let's call it s equal to 1. And so let's look at this object. This is something that I would call j, because it's an operator with dimension 1 and spin 1. This, these are the, the labels of a conserved current. Moreover, if you take a derivative, the bar derivative of this, you see that uh, this is equal to 0 up to contact term. So y you see that uh, if you take a, a derivative in z bar of this formula, this is just giving you 0 beside uh, the fact that uh, uh, you would, there's this, uh, there, there is this formula that the bar of 1 over z is a delta function. Well, sorry. Gives you a delta function. So beside contact terms, it's, it's giving you this, which is a conservation equation. And indeed, this equation is very well known in uh, 2D quantum field theories, it's just a word identity. But once you have a word identity, actually, you can just build uh, your charges. There are conserved charges. I mean, this is a very standard thing. What you do is like uh, you do an integral over some surface of your uh, conserved current, something like this. And this object is. Uh, is, uh, let's say, a charge that depends on this surface, but is topological because the, char the current is conserved. And so you can shrink it to the operators. And you can use this word identity also to compute the action on the operators. And the action will be just to read the charge. But in this case, we, we don't just read the charge because we are in two dimensions. So what we can do is actually do the, the usual thing. I mean, this in two dimension is a typical, uh, is a typical um, equation that one finds. It's like that. And this defines actually an infinite extension of your, uh, of your uh, well, of your generators. So if for the n equal to 0, you would have the usual one 
that just measure the charges, but here uh, you get an infinite extension, and so you get uh, uh, infinitely many charges. So you see, you started just by some simple soft theorem. You just do some simple uh, change of bases, and you get something that is, well, quite clearly a word identity that gives you just infinitely many charges. So this is quite striking. And, and it's, it's interesting because you can repeat the, the game for uh, the graviton case. Let me do it here. And uh, I'll be Emilio, just one brief. question. What is it? What symmetry is J a current for? Yeah, it, that would be, let's say, U1, uh, uh, if you want the U1 cut smooth, it's like a free boson uh, uh, current. So indeed, if you take a free boson and you, you compute uh, like the word identity for the current of a free boson in a 2D CFT, you, you just get exactly that. It's like not even. <laughs> so I'll think about it as uh, this U1 in the celestial, so as like an ordinary global symmetry in the celestial tier. Well, uh, yeah, you will see the, the, the point of view from asymptotic symmetry. You mm -hmm. can also understand this. From, from this point of view, it's like uh, you, you are just doing this map, mm -hmm. and uh, in these operators written in these different mm -hmm. bases, they clearly have, uh, I mean, you c can clearly see infinitely many charges acting on them instead of just one. I see. So it's like um, quite magical. Okay, thanks. And, uh, and yes, so, uh, yeah, I wanted to erase this thing. Hey, Emilio. Sure. Before you go on. So that representation A of omega, which is a sum uh, a power series, uh, I mean, A of Th omega is the full amplitude. No, uh, here I was writing, uh, I mean, a generic function, let's say f. It was just an example to say, if you have a function f that depends on omega that has, admits a power expansion, and you do its Mellin transform, how can you reconstruct the power expansion? And the point is that uh, by taking residues, uh, yeah, but, you, no, you just clear, get... But uh, how do you extend this argument to scattering amplitudes? I mean, it's the same. You, you have, uh, in that case, it was uh, an amplitude that was dependent on, uh, let's say, omega q. Then you do this Mellin transform. It becomes uh, something A delta of q. And how do you reconstruct uh, a pole that it was like 1 over omega and this uh, stuff? It's by taking the delta equal to 1 residue of uh, this thing. Okay. I see. Okay. So that's the, the statement. Yeah, thanks for, for the question. So I also have a question. So uh, how do you see that it's actually a conformal field theory? Can you say it again? Because in two dimensions, it's not just SO1, comma 1, the conformal group. You have yeah, the indeed. full Virasoro. Indeed. So I, I'm not saying uh, yet anything about uh, Virasoro. That could be just a global conformal at this point. Uh, it, it's just global conformal symmetry. Even though uh, I have to say, in that case, uh, yeah, once you have a current, actually, I mean, Virasoro is actually contained in the, in the Katsmudi. Uh, so these, these charges actually are more than uh, Virasoro, they contain Virasoro. So in practice, you can build uh, the stress tensor through, uh, there's this Sugavara construction. In practice, you take uh, J squared, and that's your stress tensor. Or in some, in some sense, you can just build uh, the LN in terms of uh, some uh, sums of, uh, well, it's something like uh, this Q squared. <laughs> Sorry, uh, it's true that when you have Katsumudi, you can build a Virasoro, but I mean, this Katsumudi is not all that you have, right? I mean, your theory presumably contains more than just this current algebra. Well, I yeah. Mean, the the, the question is whether this actually applies to the whole theory, I guess, more than just to this particular current algebra that you've constructed. I, I'm just saying that uh, at least you have uh, Virasoro, and so uh, it, it would be still like a local to DCFT, just 
through the fact that you can build uh, the, all the LNs. Then, I don't know, you can also have other stuff, but uh, that's... And uh, so, but there's, uh, there's more to it. Okay, this, uh, what, what I wanted to erase, <laughs> I don't know. I guess I wanted to erase the other thing, but yeah, this one. Also, it's, I have just 10 minutes, okay. Yeah, please. So the QK in the, I mean, the one on top of the pole, ZK minus Z, and the QN is just uh, two different things, no? Sorry, sorry, what? So you have sum over K, QK over ZK minus Z. Ah, sorry, yeah, it's a very bad, very bad notation. Yeah, let's call this, uh, or, or the other, well, let's call this uh, the small Q. These are like uh, numbers, yeah, the charges of the particle. Sorry, can I ask also another question? I heard claims about the fact that Virasoro in the celestial sphere comes from super rotations and super translations of the BMS group. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, coming to that, and also you should <laughs> wait. Uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, I don't want to steal the whole, no, 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 right, the whole topic. I how mean, is that related with the fact that we can construct Virasoro from, from here only? Because here we don't talk about gravity. Yeah, here it's actually interesting that I think you can build it uh, uh, even just with that. Mm -hmm. Still, there's something that is missing that uh, nobody complained about, so shame on you all. Uh, <laughs> so you see that uh, I'm just talking about uh, Lorentz so far, but a quantum field theory should also, uh, I mean, it's just, it's also Poincaré invariant. So what you may ask is what about translations? So it's actually a CFT, but with some weird extra symmetry that would be like translations mapped to these uh, bases. And so, well, I'm, I'm giving you some spoilers, but uh, th let me go on and I tell you how to get that. Uh, I, I'm just always erasing the wrong thing. Uh, this was already done. So, um, no, I cannot even, okay. Okay, so what I wanted to tell you is what happens from the uh, leading gravity, let's say. Uh, well, let, let's say this uh, gravity for this S minus one. And uh, okay, you can do the same thing. Uh, you, you, you have the, the formula, you have the, this prescription, you know the, how to map the poles. And so there, there's one extra thing that I didn't tell you what to do is what happens once, so you see, in this case, you will have, uh, uh, so this RQJ times omega J, but you see you have one extra omega at the numerator that doesn't cancel before it was canceling, now it's not. So what happens to that thing? So that thing, so what happens once you have an omega in, uh, uh, and you do this Mellin transform? Well, it's kind of uh, easy also. In that case, it's, it's something, um, so this was the Mellin transform, and now if you have something like that, well, let's say omega Q, if you have your function and you multiply it by omega, you can just see what it does, it just goes there. And, uh, it, and it shifts delta by one, no? So it's, it's not, uh, it's just giving you this a tilde delta plus one of q. So this is what it's doing. So once you do this, uh, this recipe, you get that the residue uh, at delta equal to one, of this operator O delta, and then you have O1, ON, is giving you something like this. J from one to N, and here you have Z bar, J minus Z bar, and Z, J minus Z, and you have O1, ON. But here there's also an OJ with a delta J plus one.
here why, so you have the delta j plus one because you had an extra omega and the rest is like the same. So you see that uh, in this case, uh, uh, this is a graviton, so it will have a, a spin two. It's coming from uh, a soft graviton, so it's a spin two object. And so you, you see it's, it's a bit of a weirder uh, animal with respect to the previous one because an operator with dim this has dimension one and spin two, so it's not typically considered as a usual uh, current or, or stress tensor of your theory. Indeed, it's, it's, uh, it's non-unitary, but it's still, uh, as you can even see from this formula, when you take two derivatives uh, in, uh, in Z bar, this thing that, uh, well, I can call it still something like J if you want, um, this thing is uh, something like zero up to contact terms. So actually these are like allowed the representation of the conformal group. They are non-unitary, but they are still uh, fine. So they are like some shortening condition that you, you find like there are some null states associated to these objects. And, um, and okay, so what it does is that, uh, so it has a weirder conservation equation, well, this, this squared uh, equal to zero, but what it does is like acting on these operators. Um, I mean, you can still build charges through that uh, and uh, until you, you will have infinitely many one, again, by, by doing some uh, powers of n, something like that. And, um, and so you have uh, an infinite extension, if you want, well, an infinite number of uh, charges. But wh what it does this is also to shift uh, uh, this delta by one. And so what is this action? Well, I, I gave you the spoiler before, but uh, this is actually the action of translations, as you can imagine, because if you take P on, on some uh, state uh, labeled by P, this is giving you P. It's not very surprising, uh, but now let's write this as an omega q, and let's do a Mellin transform of that, and so this uh, let's call the Mellin transform state as uh, delta. Sorry, if I if I want to see what, so let's do the Mellin transform. This will be a delta state, okay, and the p on the delta state is multiplying by omega, but I told you before how to do the multiplication by omega after the Mellin transform, and it's just uh, uh, shifting delta plus one. So indeed, the translation do that, and in principle, this Q is, uh, is just, uh, could be like either one, Z, Z bar, or Z, Z bar. So these are like your four translations that you can have, but you see that here you have uh, an infinite extension. So it's like having translations, but after you do this integral, you actually get uh, infinitely many because you, you could have uh, z to some powers or z bar to some powers. Okay. So you have an infinite uh, extension of translation and, well, that's what is called a super translation in the literature. So, uh, this is not using uh, the well, the asymptotic symmetry interpretation, but you can see it already at this, at this level. And okay, you can do the same thing. I, I'm not gonna enter the details because it's, uh, it's late. Uh, and, uh, but if you do the same thing uh, for the, for the subleading soft graviton, so it would be this S0, that's, uh, the computation is gonna be a bit harder, but what you are gonna find is something, okay, it's something, uh, e uh, let me, well, I can do it here. It's, uh, it, you're not quite gonna get uh, uh, a stress sensor, but almost, uh, let me tell you exactly what you get. You get, uh, in practice, the, the shadow uh, transform of a stress sensor. But, uh, uh, and you can see it because indeed this, uh, well, this subleading soft graviton was something of omega to the zero. And so delta, the polar 
the polar delta was at delta equal to zero. So you have some operator of dimension zero and spin two. You write uh, the, the word identity for that, and then you see that once you do the uh, sorry, a shadow transform of this guy, so shadow transform, I didn't introduce it, but it's, it's just a, a, a transformation that uh, changes the, the dimension. It's like two minus delta it gives you the shadow dimension that are two minus delta. So in this case, it would give you um, dimension two and spin two. And it gives you an object that uh, uh, has the same dimensions of a stress tensor. And moreover, it, the word identity would be exactly the same of the stress tensor after you do this shadow transform. I don't want to enter the detail, but in practice, uh, you get something that is a stress tensor. And so from a stress tensor, you can uh, build your LN and uh, L bar N and build your Virazor. And again, in this case, as everybody knows, uh, you have uh, L0, L1, and L minus one, which is the global part. And this part, uh, the global part, is actually giving you the usual rotation, so the one we started with. So this SOD minus one, uh, comma one is indeed captured by this global piece, but there's an infinite extension of the rotation, and so this is what uh, is called super rotation. So I think I can conclude with this, and I say just uh, that it's quite nice that uh, we didn't do much. We did just a, a Mendelian transform, and we pick the soft theorems, and you just get on the nose that uh, there's, there are infinitely many charges acting on this Mendelian transform states. And uh, well, I think it's, it's interesting. <laughs> so hopefully you agree. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I think we had already quite some uh, questions during the talk, which was great. Maybe there is time for one last question. Otherwise, we can just have questions during the break. Anything urgent? Well, if not, I, I have ah, oh yes, yes, please. Very very cool. Alas, it's good now. Um, so is there any case where thing, where there's some sort of control over these amplitudes and things have been worked out and we know what this celestial CFT is and we know which sort of uh, properties, like maybe has a OP which is associative, maybe the divergences are what you expect. Is there any case that has been worked out that can give us some more, that can convince us that this celestial CFT is the sort of CFT that we know about? Okay, so thanks for the question. I would say that uh, at this level, I would say that no. I, I mean, what, what has been done, actually, there, there are a lot of uh, works in which you take some amplitude that you know of, and then you do this Mellian transform, and you, you can check uh, things. And uh, I mean, uh, things kind of work out, decently, but, uh, but it's, uh, you never get anything that is nice, let's say. For example, you, you get uh, some very weird behavior in, if, if you take, for example, a four-point function, there's a very weird behavior in the cross-ratio that is, uh, is, I mean, what you get is not even a function of the cross-ratio, but it's, it's a distribution. So it's, it's quite nasty, let's say. What you can try to do, I mean, at this point, there are, there's a lot of work that is uh, in the direction of making this object look nice. Because you see, th this definition that I, I presented here with the, just this Mellin transform, uh, one may argue maybe one can tweak it a little bit and uh, get something that is nicer. So for example, one, can, uh, imp one could, could try to do some integrals in the, in the queues also. And uh, for example, one simple thing that one can do is some sh shadow transforms or light transforms or some uh, kind of transforms that exist in a CFT and see if, if that uh, behaves better. And, uh, and for example, if one wanted really to define an object that uh, makes sense, 
uh, as a, I mean, that really looks like a CFT correlator, uh, okay, the, the first problem is like, you don't have a, a full-fledged amplitude to start with, but you could try to do it, for example, for free theory amplitude. And in free theory, uh, if you do a shadow of, for example, all outgoing uh, particle, then you get something that looks like uh, generalized free theory. So then, uh, yes, you have uh, some control over that. But you see, uh, at this point, I would say that, uh, the, I mean, yeah, maybe not everybody is, uh, I don't know if Laura <laughs> agrees with me, or maybe it's not uh, the same, uh, I mean, this is my point of view, let's say, that um, it, it's hard to get something that really looks like a normal CFT. This would be an attempt and uh, and you would get something that is just generalized free theory. But uh, yeah, maybe there are other directions. Okay, thank you very okay, much. Thanks. thanks. Anything more from uh, uh, the Zoom room? Any more questions, comments? Okay, if not, then I suggest that we thank Emilia again.